Hey, how you doing? This is Mick Tully from World of Martial Arts Television. Mahi Paolunia. Mahi, first of all, great to catch up with you again, my friend. And you've piqued my interest. You sent me a message on Facebook talking about a mad experiment. After the last symposium, you said that you had a madder experiment. So for the guys watching, it blew my mind, by the way, guys. So buckle in and listen to this description. It's a pleasure being here with you guys. So mad experiment. So what is it? I'm calling it shock and awe, right? So what we are looking at is all the various kinds of speed and the purpose of speed, which is superior timing so that you finish a fight, right? So it's one of the most, uh, two of the most important attributes, but you know, you can't, you can't make the distinction between speed, distance, and time. You have to see and understand them together. And that's the crux of it. Now, when you talk to most people, uh, when you say speed, what they're really talking about is initiation speed. How quickly can I finger jab you? Or how quickly does my jab land? But that is so short-sighted, right? You, you, have, you have over a dozen different kinds of speed uh, that exist. And if you think about it, you're only as fast as the weakest link in that speed chain. Right? right? So you have everything from, hey, what's my proprioception speed where I'm beginning to figure out where I'm in time and space? What is my perception and mental speed where I'm beginning to able to recognize the pattern of the heuristics of attack and what, what, my, what my counters might be? My initiation speed, my alteration speed, which is the ability to change direction, my, my combination speed, right? My, my speed of recovery, my mental speed, my emotional speed right? Then how do you also move beyond speed, which is, uh, uh, you know, that famous line in um, um, Enter the Dragon, where that old monk asks Bruce, so you hit him? He said, no, it hit by itself. So there's no thought, there's no I, right? It happens by itself. Uh, you have that. Then you have the speed of deception, how you do setups and how deception comes into play and how do you quickly change things. What, what Boyd uh, uh, in the 50s, uh, when he came up with the OODA loop, would have called uh, uh, creating novelty in a system so that you're unpredictable, right? Uh, right. You, have, you have that deception speed, but it doesn't end there. Look, all of us are sooner or later going to become old farts, hopefully, and not die at 32, right? So uh, as we are growing and becoming old farts, that physical speed diminishes. We end up with yep. bad knees, bad hips, bad elbows. Uh, our eyesight goes to dogs, so to speak, right? And, you know, we're not as pretty yep. as we think we are, but that affects our speed too, yeah? And what happens then? So there's this whole idea of mature speed where I'm playing the game but I'm just outside your range and able to get you at will slowly, but you can't get me. This is the true meaning of, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast, but that takes years and years of refinement. And then what do you do when you have limitations? Uh, such as uh, one of our ambassadors, he's paralyzed from his waist down, but you won't be able to touch him. So you have no footwork, you're not able to move, and how do you still maintain, how do you still maintain that speed? So that, and then we have some guys who train professional sports teams uh, and are working with them to help them build their sense of proprioception where they are in time and space and how to build hand-eye coordination, which is a key skill set. And then uh, finally, a Bruce Lee scholar who's basically been working with us to figure out all the speed timing drills that Bruce Lee did from the Wing Chun days all the way to later stage JKD. Right, and then of course trapping and throwing speed. So now imagine all these different components of speed, getting some of the best of the best in the world for that piece, putting them in a room together, and saying, "Showcase what you do, teach what you do, and let's go forward." So that's the damn insane experiment. <laughs> but did you know what? As you're saying this, you've just been firing off so many sit maps in my head because the first thing I thought about. Was, uh, bear in mind, I'm a comic book geek, right? And uh, the latest movie, spoiler alert, apart from Michael Keaton, not very good. The Flash movie. But, uh, hey, come on, Keaton will save anything, right? Uh, but, the, yeah, that was always been one of my favourite superheroes. 
But what you, you were just saying something there that got me. You were on about the initial speed. But the initial speed will be the speed of thought. Because in every sci-fi movie ever, it was speed of sound first, speed of light. Now it's speed of thought. And now that's the, the thing that's got me. Because the, But the speed of thought and the awareness, I don't think if it, if it diminish. I, I think it actually becomes better as you get older. Right. So I'd like, I'd like your thoughts on that. If you train it, right? If you train it, and that's what I call maturing speed. So I would say that that's something faster than speed of thought. Because if you think about thought, thought is based in time. And if you study Krishnamurti's works or any of the Indian, old Indian mystics and Chinese mystics, thought is time is distance. So that itself has defined the limits of movement. But when we're talking about transcending thought, and where it hits by itself. And there's no thought, there is no uh, no idea of what might happen. That's a whole different, uh, that's a whole different realm, right? So I, I, I hear you, I agree with you. I think there are way higher levels of speed. And then, you know, I, I'd done work in the uh, now so-called former Soviet, uh, Eastern Soviet bloc. And some of the things that they doing there is mind bending. I mean, uh, I can't even bring some of that stuff forth uh, without being called a nut job, right? And uh, uh, but yeah. but yes, there are there are. Let's just say this, you know, there are limits to physical speed which diminish over time. You have also emotional speed, which is your emotional content, right? And if you don't get that under control, it actually slows you down. So it can either act as a brake or an accelerator, depending on how right. you use it correctly. What the mental speed gives you is it gives you a target. It starts converting speed into velocity, right? Uh, which is yeah. that it targets in mind and I'm going after it, right? It also helps you figure out how to do setups and everything else. And then uh, for the lack of a better term, there is this whole arena of uh, psychic and spiritual speed, right? And, and when I use that word, I mean, it's beyond man. It's beyond your conception of I but it just happens by itself. But right? you see this, this, bro, this is the thing, right? When when I, when I you sent me over the clip and you said, for your eyes only, I checked it out. And I watched it and then I watched it again. And like Mahi, you know me well enough to know now, right? That I'm the least woo-woo person on the planet. So when people start talking about metaphysics, I'm like, whoa, I'm a big fan of physics, but metaphysics, I need to see it to believe it, right? But... What the like the case that you're making for me? By by the way, as you, it's just as you're explaining to this, explains this to me. I'm getting it in my head now, where it's like, you know, the, it's the old trope of the the old master, you know, who can visualize what's going to happen. He knows it's, and you're like, is that what we, is that the thing that we're scratching here? Is that is that the level? I, I think that's towards? part of it, right? Uh, that's part of it. So. Um... I think all of us at some times have experienced this. Uh, let's say you're driving really fast on a highway, right? Yeah. And you're about to crash or an accident's going to happen. Suddenly, everything goes into slow motion. Your perception of time has changed. So it's a phenomena in hypnosis that we call time distortion. So speed is really playing with your sense of time and the other person's sense of time. And time is relative. Right. Yeah. So so the reason it is uh, metaphysical is because most people, most of us don't understand time and how it can change. It's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, let's say uh, uh, let's say you're standing um, you're standing um, in, in front of an ATM or a bank teller and there are five people ahead of you. You know, the second clock moves like. Right. Exactly. And then you're on a hot date and time just flies and you're like, oh my God, what happened? It's, it's five hours past, right? So, but it's the same, same amount of time, but your entire experience of it and how involved you were or not involved you were changes your perception, right? And that usually is not in conscious control. Learning how to bring that in, by the way, this is not something we'll be covering in the lab. This is a, this is a few years of study, but getting that under control is is a critical piece. Does that does that make Man, sense, buddy? One hundred and ten percent. Yeah. It's uh, again. 
it's very matrixy black mirror to me but it you know it's that whole thing where it's um you you know your perception of time uh you just you said something earlier where we were on about if we're lucky enough to become older you know uh, i use this all the time where people complain about their knees and i'm like a lot of people don't get the they don't get the luxury of growing old mate you know what i mean it don't worry about that but the the perception of time is as you get older, it seems to go quicker. Yes. And there's and there's this concept that when you're 20, five years is a long time because that's a quarter of your life. And yep. it's that whole, it's looking back on that body of work to be able to do it. So as you're saying about speed, it's making me go, yeah, you know, I wouldn't mind slowing things down a little bit if possible, maybe squeeze a few more decades out. I'm halfway to 110 now, mate. So, you know, at 55, I want to slow it down a little bit. Now, if you don't mind me uh, asking, right? So you said a few key words there that literally are, as they would say now on, on Twitter, a bit of a hot topic. So you mentioned late stage Jeet Kune Do, then talked about intercepting blows. Then you talked about breaking timing understanding rhythm it sounds like this is a uh, some heresy especially on the anniversary of bruce's death that to be uh to, to be looking to be looking at this with a not a critical eye but a, an eye that wants to understand what it was all about because what you're saying to me about understanding speed and timing uh was there anybody ever on celluloid who was as good when it came to time as Bruce Lee, because his techniques weren't that flashy, were they? But the intercepting fist, the whole lot. So my question is two parts. First one is, have you shared this on the demonic thing that is social media and taken all the slings and arrows? That's the first one. And secondly, what was it like getting any sort of feedback? But uh, let me just back up before I get to your two questions, all right? Is it heresy? No, it should be the greatest compliment to him, right? Because, uh, you know, where he talks about, everyone likes to say, hey, absorb what is useful, blah, 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 you know, the line from Mao, but they, yeah. they forget the sentence that precedes it, which is from your own experience. Exactly. That's number one. Number two, anytime you give something a name, uh, an idea, it becomes a hypothesis. And if you say you're going after a scientific method, shouldn't you test the hypothesis and be able to replicate it? Or do you belong to the church and religion of uh, put your favorite character, Flash, Gordon, <laughs> Mandrake, Lee, right? Uh, so I think I think the high it's not heresy as much as the highest compliment to all those who came before us and said, hey, this is what I hold to be true, right? But don't take my word for it. From your own experience, go test it out. Now, to answer your two questions, yes, I posted it on social media. Uh, gotten a lot of interesting private messages, let's just say that. Everything from <laughs> uh, you're taking sides, this camp, that camp. And I'm like, you know what, guys? You know the thing I love about America? I say, what? I said, anyone can do any shit you want. So why don't you go do it instead of telling me what I should be doing, right? Uh, of course, they go silent then. Well, but Mike, can I just stop you right there? I just need to ask you, first of all, where have you parked the DeLorean that hit 88? Because you have come back from the future because that sort of level-headed chat right there doesn't exist anymore. You need to go back before the internet was invented. Uh, well, I haven't said that. We used to argue. I don't know if you remember, but we used to argue in the back of Kung Fu magazines back in yeah. the day. So we, we just have more of it now. That's the only thing. But that was a, it's very level-headed that you said that because, again, this understanding of speed is, um, again, as you were saying it, Bruce Lee is the man, right? Anybody who got into martial arts who said that they didn't have a small little bit of influence from Bruce I don't believe them, especially our generation, right? But the thing that always drew everyone to him 
yeah, all right, he was in pretty good shape for a five foot seven Chinese guy, but his speed was phenomenal. And everyone, like, remember, for a long time, everyone said he was just born like that. And I'm like, well, I don't know much about statistics, but guess I think what? I think that is a discredit to the hard work he put in. I think so, too. So that's going to lead me on to now. Because we, we now know how much physical training he actually did and how far ahead of the game he was, because everyone thinks about the philosophy, but it's understanding the calisthenics, uh, plyometrics, or resistance, resistance training. Like he knew, he was one of the first guys to turn around and say, why are you punching fresh air? If you're not, if you're not in, hitting impact, you're not getting not that getting feedback. feedback. It's not real. Exactly. So what, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is now, from this mad experiment, physically, what, what sort of training is going to be uh, on offer? Okay. So uh, I want to say this first, that this is part one of a three-part uh, three-part plan that I have, right? So if you if you look at any system around the world, I'm answering your question. I have to just take a little sideways road, but indulge me. Always. If you look at any system in the world, it's specialized in one or two ranges. Yeah. Right? And so when they develop speed, it was in the context of that particular range. Right? Yeah. Now we live in a world where we have all these ranges. And if you're blind to the range where he's 12 feet from you and your basic proprioception has failed and your, uh, you know, your ability to calculate and diffuse the situation has failed, but I'm waiting to you know, uh, do a paksao and a BG and you know, jab him in the eye. I mean, to me, that's wasted movement. That's a wasted opportunity. So, so what we are doing is we are looking at the physical attributes of all the ranges from where you're way out of range and you're able to perceive and if you're smart enough, avoid the damn thing. Because you know what? Even when you win, you don't win because you have you end up paying a heavy price for it. Right. So that's 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 one piece. Then you know how you get into say whip and sword fighting range. People are on only I mean, I don't care if you move even as fast as Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee didn't break the sound barrier. The whip does. Okay? Yeah. Uh, Bruce Lee wouldn't be able to move half as fast as a good Kali man moving with his sticks. So there's a different... So there's nothing against Bruce. He specialized. He was really good. He influenced many of us, including me, deeply. Right? But there are other kinds and other levels of speed that also have to be looked at. And these come from different ranges, from different cultures. Right? Now, yeah. when you now you start getting into kicking and punching range, now you get into when you start getting into kicking and punching range, you also have to develop what I call sensitivity speed. And when I say sensitivity, people just assume Wing Chun. No, there are traditions far older than Wing Chun, and that's what one of our ambassadors is going to show as to how the Chinese developed what is called listening energy, right? And how do I actually listen with my whole body and my psyche, right? So you get into the listening, that, that sensitivity and listening range where I don't have to be in my cheese out range to begin, right? And now from there, I'm getting into my trapping and grappling. Now we have a ninth degree Kung Fu San Su, a world Shui Jiao champion and BJJ fifth down going to show how to throw quickly. And he also does wow. sumo, okay? So <laughs> he's going to show, okay, from the trapping, how do you get into throwing and on the ground, right? So you have to look at all those ranges, but there's also one other piece. The, those old old Japanese Koryu traditions that a lot of people say, ah, fufu, that doesn't work. But what they're doing is they're comparing a sport with a battlefield tradition of that day. But what they did yeah. really well is learn the idea of Sen, which is how do I get my mental and emotional content in place so that, you know, this machine, no mind, nothing comes in the way. Right? Be, how do yeah. how do I build that? So you know, we're looking at all these physical aspects and saying at all these ranges, let's isolate the different pieces and see what are the key skills that you can start to develop. That's part one. Now, part two um, will be we'll start going into some of the new sports science. This is probably in the next year, year and a half, and how the the latest discoveries in sports science uh, and with some of the special forces outside of traditional one-on-one -on -one fighting, what are their findings? 
Like how do they tweak their vestibular system to have superior balance? How do they, how, how have they figured out to go from your foveal vision to peripheral vision, right? So those are things that, you know, that, that shift of going from peripheral, uh, from foveal to peripheral slows time down, but most people don't know how to do it, right? So, so that that's part two and part three is a little more weirder. I don't want to talk about it yet, but that's 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 the way we're building up. So so what we hope that participants will walk away from is get a more fuller understanding of the speed. Now, here's an example, right? Most people have no idea what positional speed means. Now, what does that mean? Right. How do I get myself into such a position where my opponent is always slower than me, where I do half the work that he does and I still land home? Yeah. You, 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 the thing, just as you're saying this, uh, because as you're saying this, my brain's going crazy. Because first of all, I try and teach kids about peripheral vision. And I use the Kali as an example. And then I always explain to them that in every Kung Fu movie you'll ever see, there'll either be a guy blindfolded or, you know, that nonchalant thing. Remember, back in the day, you see a guy demoing. And I'd be like, that guy really believes his own press. He's not even looking at the guy. And that was my ignorance because I didn't realize he wasn't, he was working his peripheral vision. He was actually, what that's what he was doing, right? So that's the first thing. This is why these are hitting home for me. Then in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, I have it all the time now where guys are like, yeah, but how are you able to beat me? And I went, because I've already dug your grave. You know, you're, you're in the worst position ever. I'm in the best position. Yeah, but how? And I went, because I'm a bit of a sociopath. And I, I was thinking about getting you in the car like before we even got here. And like this is why it's all hitting me now, because I'm thinking, it's exactly where you're talking about time. I'm like, yeah, but that's how I treat my training. I'm driving, to, I'm driving away to train, and I'm thinking, who's going to be there tonight? And I'm like, right, okay. Yeah, I won't mention names, because so they're all dear friends of mine. But they, they've all got certain games. And I'm like, right, well, if he's there, this is what I'm going to do today. And then obviously... I do a lot of this, oh, you're that guy bit. So if they set up, they look for the armbar, I went, oh, you're that guy. They said a man would come and he would be able to armbar me once. I didn't think it'd be you. And then obviously they normally bail on the armbar and then they do something else. So it's kidology, really. But that understanding of timing, because I'm not even in the gym at that point. I'm, yeah, and that's, you see, this has really got me, got, got, got me, uh, well, it's, it's got me thinking because, I, I, as I said I, I, in the build-up, that initially I thought this was going to be like some sort of uh, exploration on the speed force in the Flash movies, you know? But then when you think about physics, you're like, well, all it is is just a little bit quicker, you know? So can you tell me the genesis of this project? When did you first think, right, okay, I'm just going to focus on what and look, if you don't mind me saying it, Mahi, right? I do like it because it, it shows exactly the way you think. Because normal, no, I don't want to say normal people, normally people, normally or normal people, uh, no, no, normally people would look at a technique and they go, right, okay, we're going to work from the jab or we're going to work from the cross. And what you've done is worked away from all of that and just go, no, we're just going to, you, you've picked up speed. It could have been power, it could have been balance. It could have been any of the building blocks that you actually, because everyone talks about you need superior technique and you're like, yeah, but, you know, we call it chi, we call it key, we call it whatever. But at the end of the day, it's really physics first, right? So where yeah. was the genesis of this idea for you? Yeah, I'll answer that. It's like, you know, you have a, a superior AR-15 and you miss and I have a kitchen knife and I connect, you know, what would you rather have? <laughs> You know, so um, genesis of this idea. Well, um, a big influence on my life has been Maestro James Keating. And he he's influenced uh, not just my martial arts, but how to think about it, you know, and how to unpack it. So it was uh, in one of the trainings with him where we were talking about different kinds of speed and, you know, how, how it happens. And that was the genesis of it uh, around 2017, 2018. And since then, I've been trying to um, break it apart and make sense of it and say, okay, 
how do we do this? And, uh, you know, no one person is going to be able to um, do it all. You know, they may be able to have timing through that particular path, but there are many paths that lead to the top of the mountain. So being able to examine all of them, and then when we look at our own attribute development or fight development, uh, we can choose to say, okay, these are the pieces I want to tweak and work on, number one, or B, hey, let me be aware of this because if I've never played this game at this range or know how how the speed can manipulate there, right? I won't know what hit me if I get there, right? So yeah. that was the genesis about 2017, 2018. And uh, it took me a good four or five years to kind of uh, uh, at least conceptually have these three different labs set up, uh, part one, part two, part three, the first one looking at the the physical pieces mainly and looking at uh, the different ranges and uh, start getting people to think about speed a little more holistically, right? Uh, rather, a little more comprehensively rather than, hey, let me just, bam, I got it, you know? Yeah, but it's, it's funny because uh, from your last, it's almost, um, it's almost like the complete opposite to the symposium that you just had, which was a showcase of all different arts, all different people. And then now it's like, yeah, there's all different people, but there's only one thing we're working towards now. So it's almost like, uh, if you imagine using, I'll use something as basic as an angle one in Carly, and then go, right, okay, I'm gonna get four different arts to show me their interpretation of an inward caveman strike go and then it's like uh are you looking for similarities in the different approaches to it or are you looking for like the differences in their approaches yes <laughs> you should have been a politician mate i told you <laughs> uh, no see um if you are always just looking for similarities you generalize too much and you lose the beauty of the differences. And if you're always looking for the differences, you become a damn expert in little things and lose the big picture, right? So I like to think about it as, this is why I say, you know, it's the age for a martial comprehensivist, right? Where wow. you are able to think comprehensively, you, you know, <sighs> Uh, I think it was Hemingway, I could be wrong, but I think it was Hemingway. He says, you want to be T-shaped, you know, you have real depth in one particular area and then you have breadth and you're able to go across uh, uh, multiple realms with ease. And that's what develops fluency. And, you know, uh, Robert Heinlein uh, said it beautifully where he's like, uh, specialization is for insects. Yeah. Wow, Heinlein <laughs> said that. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, it, when you said it, I, I know. I think it was Hemingway who said it, but uh, a really dear friend of mine, John Will, one of the first uh, non-Brazilian black belts, he always says this. He said, "People want to specialize, but they also want to know everything." He says, "Right now, people just want to have this all-encompassing knowledge." He uses jujitsu because that's his art, and he said. Everyone wants to understand everything broadly, but they only want to dig about three inches down. He said, no, no, you want to understand broadly, but you want to really understand deeply. And it, it, like he used the analogy of uh, drilling for oil. He said, you, you've just got to keep going. And then if that doesn't work, then you go somewhere else. And it, 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 I, I, do, I do like what you said there. It, we, are, we are in that age right now where people would rather look like they knew loads. Yeah, and I think I think you know the mistake. The mistake is between means and ends. You know, even if I don't hit gold, it's who I become in the process of pursuing that gold that forever transforms me, right? And then the fact that hey, I get this right now. Like, wait, you were doing historical European arts, and you're doing what now? I'm like, you, you know, the essence of freedom is to be outside of other people's definition of you. Wow. Uh, now that's that, that that's profound yeah that that but but having said that isn't isn't that what we aspire to be as martial artists that whole thing where you walk in the room and people go i didn't realize you did that 
And you're like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd rather you knew, I'd rather you thought I was Bruce Wayne than Batman. You know what I mean? It's that whole yeah. secret identity thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, you know. I think, um, I think it's a maturity process from my perspective. Like when you first start, uh, when you first start uh, getting something, you want to show it, especially in this social media heavy world, there's this amplification of what you do, right? But you sooner or later, you realize that you don't want to show your gold. Because when you show your gold too much, uh, they know where to get you. Yeah. Right. So I think as you start, maybe we're becoming old farts, Mick. You know, we don't want to show our gold and we just want to, we just want to be like, I just want to have fun, you know? Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me of that scene uh, uh, from Zorro, Antonio Banderas, and Anthony Hopkins. And, uh, you know, with such little movement and elegance, the swords (laughs) off, off, you know? You know what? That's the kind of old man I want to be, you know? That sort of leans us into where, where, where I'd like to go with this. You, you've mentioned a few times about becoming an old fart, the passage of time, right? Now, this study that you've been undertaking in time, is this not just for martial arts, but for this crazy thing that we called life as you're going through it? Have you learned about the human condition with that? It has, because, you know, when, when, when we do experiments like this as well, and life in general, you get to see the true sides, the true sides of people. You know, you very quickly make the distinction between those who will be on your team and those who won't, eh? you know, those yeah. who will who'll show up with a machete and cover your back and those who will be like, hey, man, I had a phone call. I'm sorry, I couldn't pay attention. You know, you yeah. quickly... You quickly figure out who your circles are, and secondly, I think um, you know, like a, 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 an old mentor of mine. One of the things he taught me was, he's like, "We want to become ever so ordinary in the pursuit of extraordinary knowledge." The problem today is people want to be very extraordinary with very ordinary knowledge, right? So, so. That's the pursuit. So that's why I seek the very best of the best who will make me ever more humble so that I realize all the things that I don't know. And in that process, spark my interest, my curiosities, and, uh, you know, all the stuff that's fun for me. And it, hopefully it, that slows down the aging process. <laughs> well, well, you know, this is the thing, right? Just as you were saying that, uh, my mind went straight back to a, a quote from Hemingway, where Hemingway said, the crazy thing about being a human being is it takes two years to learn how to talk, and then it takes 60 years to learn how to listen. And I'm like, the man's got a real point there. And the, the, the ordinariness, that really has hit me, because for the longest time ever, uh, and I... Like, I'm not, I'm not a narcissist, but I had, I've always had a very high opinion of myself. But that's only because, it's the truth, I'm, I'm being honest here. Uh, up until 16, I was told I was worthless. So I created the person I am today, yeah? So I was told I was going to be nothing. And then I'm like, right, okay, guess what? Not only am I going to do it, but I'm going to excel at it. And right up into, but even now, I'm still sort of the same sort of person. Why do you do jiu-jitsu? Why do you want to fight guys 30 years younger than you? because I can, and I enjoy it. But the other part of it is, and now this dear listener, you've heard it here first. I'm actually, come, I'm coming to the point in my life where I'm like almost getting to be at peace with being ordinary. And I know that sounds crazy because that's a full circle yin and yang thing. But I, 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 I no longer need to be the most interesting person in the room. I no longer need to be the most uh, humorous person, well-read person. I'm quite happy to just look now and go, right, okay, let's see if this guy's got anything interesting. Because I've spent probably <laughs> probably 30 years not listening to people. Because I'm like, no, I'm infinitely more interesting than you are. You know what I mean? If you're any good, you'll look your game. But it, it just, it's like, you know, I didn't think this was where we were going to go with this combo. Because, so good. but no, 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 but it is good because it's like, it's that it's the understanding of the passage of time. When I was coming into this, I was thinking we're just going to talk about how fast you can make my jab. And now you're making me think all sorts of mad existential 
bear in mind if I was 16, I wouldn't be able to have this because these dark thoughts wouldn't be good for me. But this, I'm like, forget it. I'm not going to listen to that. But it's the whole, just as you were, as you were saying there earlier, you know, slowing down the passage of time and trying to stay more childlike, you know, with that, you know, just the way that you look at stuff with that childlike wonder. And uh, man, uh, May, yet again, you, you've taken me to places I didn't think I was going to go when we when we started this podcast. So, so, so when does this mad experiment start? Where is it? And how do you get involved? So all the info is on www.theimmersionlabs.com. It's November 3rd to November 5th. Uh, now, when I say three days, I mean three days. You, your, your ass is going to be on the mat 14 to 16 hours a day. Okay? So I'm not talking about come at 12 and leave at 3, right? Yeah. And that constitutes a day. No. Uh, you will come in at 6 a.m. and we'll probably go past 10 p.m. Wow. Okay? So, so think about it as 40 hours on mat and you have 15 sessions, okay? from some of the best in the world. So it would be like, in my opinion, getting 15 to 20 seminars in concentrated in one place, one time, where you're able to holistically look at it. It's going to be uh, the Bay Area, California. The way you get involved is uh, just as always, uh, there's an application form. We need you to fill out the application form. Uh, we go through an NDA and we have an interview. People are like, oh, you're just trying to make it elitist. I'm like, no, we get some very strange people, right? And I learned the hard way when in one particular experiment, I had two rival gangs from two different countries show up because they didn't want the other guy there. Okay? Oh, wow. And I was like, no, I don't want to deal with this. And, you know, it just takes away from, takes away from what we are trying to do. Uh, we are trying to be the Switzerland where everybody comes and everybody's able to do things, right? Because uh, this is not about being political or affiliated to anyone or anything. And that's why even the name that I have has nothing to do with martial arts, right? So it's like, yeah. it's just about jumping in, immersing yourself. And that's that's what you're trying to do. So yeah, November 3rd to November 5th, get your application in sooner than later. And we tip, uh, we why, why the application? Just a couple of things, you know, hey, want to make sure we have a broad range of people right uh, because if, if we just create an echo chamber that's useless like at the last event i had two of my biggest critics show up as my as participants wow you, you need to do it because i think your critics can be your best mirrors and then suddenly they became friends uh, you know so it's funny how that happens right yes. so uh uh, we want a broad range. I want to make sure that I have a zero asshole policy. You know, uh, once you're on the training mat, that's a zero asshole policy. This time I'm also going to have a dumpster outside that says park your ego here. So we will return it with interest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so second and third, you know, guys who are capable of coming with an empty cup. Uh, if you already know everything about everything, then why waste your time and money? And why should I listen to you? You figure it all out. Be have fun. <laughs> here, here we are. Guy, here is a bunch of guys who want to live the questions rather than uh, pontificate the answers. So, but that's it, the kind it, of people it, I'm looking for. Well, you see, like May, as always, it's always great chatting to you. But uh, I, I do. I, I like your outlook. Yeah, the Switzerland thing. My children say that to me all the time. Because if I ever ask them for, for their opinion on anything, they always go, because I'm quite a contentious individual. And they go, Dad, I'm Switzerland. It used to be neutral. Then it's now I'm Switzerland. And then it's like, no, sorry, Swiss. They won't, they won't, they won't get involved in it. But uh, I, I really like, as I said, Mahi, always love chatting to you. But it, you, you make, it's, cra it's crazy because you're one of the only people that I interview that makes me really think. Because normally it's dead easy. And I, that's not that's not to denigrate anybody I've ever uh, interviewed before, uh, because it's quite easy. You just have to do a bit of, bit of research. And then if it's going to be about karate, we've always got some common ground. But with you, whenever we talk, you always make me start thinking, pondering questions. And I'm like, oh, going to have to sit and think about that, uh, which which is what it's all about, really. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll take that as the highest compliment because I think it's people who 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 make us question our reality, make us question how we think think things and reorganize how we think and show up in life. They're the ones who change things, right? Because as you were as you were talking about the armbar, whatnot, I, I remember my this one old sensei. He was five foot four, but man, he would crank those locks up. And no matter what I did, I knew he was going to do that particular armbar. I knew it. And he would tell me he would do it. And then he would do it. And yeah. I hated him for it, right? But he left me with a great advice that just took 20 years for it to make sense. Okay. I said, okay, I don't want to be here. I, you know, I, I don't like this. I, how do I counter it? And he said something that I, back then I thought he was a smart ass, but he gave me the answer. I just didn't have the perspective to see it. He said, be where the lock is not. Oh, that's, that, that is profound. Yeah. He said, be that is where the lock is not. It just took me 20 years to understand. <laughs> oh, yeah, but unfortunately, you know, the, the, you know, the thing is though, Mahi, some people wouldn't even get that. That's... It, it could take a lot longer than 20 years to get it. But it, 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 isn't that, like, to round it all out, man, That doesn't that just sum up the simplicity of it all? It's like, we're trying to make it up. This is the best description I've ever heard about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu ever. And I'm going, to, I, I'm going to give him the credit it's due. One of my main training partners now is a guy called Wayne Lakin, Olympic level judoka, He's amazing. I think he's a fourth or a fifth dam at judo. Put the white belt on at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's come. He really enjoys it. Loves every minute of it. And he said, I've got this theory how Jiu-Jitsu was developed. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, you know, they went over. Maeda went over to Japan, over to Brazil, gave them part of the system. They had to figure out the rest. That's why it's this brand new martial art. And he went, no, they just looked at judo and went, how can we complicate this shit even more? And that was the thing. And I was like, that's Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Because when you get judokas in, everyone's like, he's got a very limited game. And you're like, he's got a, he's got a great juji katami that he can hit from 15 positions. Yeah, but he hasn't got 15 arm bars. He doesn't need 15 he's arm bars. One. He needs the one arm bar and the 15 ways to get there. And when he said that, I was like, you're right. And without sounding all cosmic, as you get older and, you know, you look back at, on all the older guys that you see training and in the movies, and it was always the guy, all of his knowledge was always that profound, but it was always really, really basic. You know, yeah. it was all, yeah, wax yeah. off, wax off. That was it. It was, you know, like, know, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> If I may share this, uh, there are two older gentlemen coming to teach. Uh, not not too many people know them, uh, and that's shame on them for not knowing them, right? One is Olohe Jerry Walker, is the la one of the last grand masters of the Hawaiian art of lua. I talked to him about uh, speed and taking part in it. He's like, I got old man speed, man. I got timing. I don't need speed. <laughs> that was this one sentence. I was like, you got to be there. And then Patrick Strong. First generation yes. student. Yeah, Patrick And Strong. the man yeah. is insanely fast. You know, I mean, you don't know what fast is until you felt the man, you know? And yeah, he's in his 80s and he's faster than me. So part of me wants to say, oh shit. But the other part says, wow, I can get there. When I'm 80, yep. I want to beat this old man. I want to be better than he was. So, you know, that perspective can, can, no, but, but that's the thing is, yeah, I think that, yeah, there's a good way to, to round it up. You know, it's the whole, the one thing that I, when I got into martial arts, it was the inspirational and aspirational nature of it. You know, I was inspired by people. And then as the years have gone on, I have people now telling me, the only reason I'm in here is because I see you still doing it and I'm able to do it. And, you know, it would be remiss of me. It's Bruce's anniversary of his death. And I, the, it is a classical mess. And you just met, mentioned Patrick Strong. And as I always say, you know, Mark's, Mark Stewart, uh, you know, he, he's from a completely different lineage in Jeet Kune Do, but I love the guy. I think he's amazing. I love and, him. He's yeah, I, and I, look, honestly, you know, the, on, his, on the 50th anniversary of the death of Bruce Lee, when you mentioned Pat, Patrick Strong, I'm thinking to myself, 
wouldn't it be great? Because all of those original guys, they never fell out with anybody. It's all of their acolytes and disciples that seem to argue with each other. And it's like, you know, because Guru Dan will never say a bad word about anybody. And most of well, even I stay in line because I don't want to upset Guru. But the thing is, it's only when guys act like complete clowns, but it's none of the older guys. And, you know, it is that, wouldn't it be great as, yeah, you've created Switzerland. Wouldn't it be great if some of these guys actually just went to the Alps? You know what I mean? And just... Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I really hope so because I think, I think, you know, for all the talk about using Novi as the way, no limitation, no map, uh, so many of them have boxed themselves in into their own prisons and become their own guards. And they almost... Um, this is my perspective. What the hell do I know? But it to me, it feels uh, like... No, I uh, totally agree. I, uh, uh, it feels uh, like, my, oh, my... you want to be in my prison? You better pay me X amount of dollars before I give you the privilege of being in my prison. Yeah, but you see, mate, this is the thing. This is And this is all lineages. I have friends of mine, and I, I they're lovely guys, and I don't mind this being on on, on this. Yeah, this is, my, this is my part and shot on this thing. I've got friends of mine from all lineages, and I mean including mine, who have literally allowed themselves to, you know, go from that once fluid man. You know what I mean? You know, the, the gravestone that Bruce famously yeah. had made up. And I'm, I'm, I'm going, but you're a slave to it. And like, don't get me wrong. I get it thrown at me all the time. All you do is Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Thai boxing, boxing, and a bit of Carly. And I'm like, yeah, but that's what suits me. When I go to a restaurant, I only eat prime rib, chicken wings, and I might have, I'll have gherkins if they're frickles, you know, as long as they're deep fried. But that's how my martial arts is. And you look at this guy, but I'm prepared to try anything else. And I see it, especially in Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do should have been MMA, but we were too busy arguing with each other. That's why. Who, who would want to turn up and see a load of guys bitching at, bitching about each other? It's, it's ludicrous. And then yeah. uh, you're not very good. And I'm like, I know I'm not very good. That's why I'm still training, mate. You don't need to tell me anything that I don't know. Like, like I tell all yeah. the guys, I'm like, it's, I agree with you. Like, yeah. you know, what I tell them is, hey, you really want to beat up an Indian guy with glasses? You think that's going to improve your street cred? But what happens when I kick your ass? <laughs> you know? uh, Ouch. That, that's, that's the thing, bro. That's the thing. But my, as I said, I, I really mean this from the bottom of my heart, man. Always great to see you. Uh, uh, Thank you, sir. And for the guys who are watching, it's a real shame that we can't ever record when I'm talking to Mahi off camera because now that would be a great podcast. But uh, yeah, the lads, you had me in trouble, Mick. <laughs> we'd both be in trouble then. But Mahi, so good to see you, brother. As always, thank you, brother. Thanks, Thanks brother.